79% of the energy that is spent in Alaskan households goes towards space heating. So, of course, the first thing, a number one priority for uh, reducing that is to have a good, tight, warm building envelope. And once you've got that commitment, where you've got a nice, good, warm, tight building envelope where your heating loads are down, that's when you can say, hey, I want to take the next step here and try uh, approach my commitment towards, say, net zero energy. This fall, we buried a 25,000 gallon insulated steel tank adjacent to our building. This is a seasonal thermal storage system that enables us to take one step closer in our approach to make this new building addition run completely off of uh, renewable energies. The biggest advantage of the solar thermal system is uh, in the summertime or the time when the sun is there, of course, you can collect the heat from the sun and use that heat. Uh, of course, in November, December, January, when the sun goes away, you don't get to collect that heat or use it. The purpose of this tank is that it's a bank of heat and we can take that energy, store it over the summer, over the fall and into the winter and then when November and December come around and there's not enough sun to get usable energy for our building, we can draw from the tank and use that in our building. The best way to maximize the heat that you have stored in your seasonal thermal storage tank is with this low grade, low temperature heat. With this inflow radiant heat there are uh, plastic tubing that's embedded in this concrete and when you run your hot water through it the concrete acts as a bit of a radiator cooling the water but warming you. The lower the temperature of the water that we need the more we can maximize the available heat in the tank. The CCHRC's building edition was designed to use no fossil fuels at all. The solar thermal storage will provide roughly 40 to 45 percent of the heat required to heat the building. Everything else, what the solar doesn't provide, the pellet boiler will provide for heating. Well, we've had a lot of people come into CCHRC and say, hey, what can we do with the solar thermal, seasonal thermal storage systems? We hear people are doing this in Alaska, what can you tell us about it? We had this opportunity to put in our own seasonal thermal storage tank, instrument it ourselves, and we're going to put that data right up online for anyone in the world to come look and, and watch how our system is doing, how much energy we're making, how much energy we're using, how much energy we're, we're storing. Everyone's interested in economic sustainability. You want a quick payback, that kind of sustainability, you get there with a nice warm envelope and a nice tight envelope. So lots of insulation, um, lots of air tightness. Um, I wanted to take another step. I wanted to step into the uh, environmental uh, sustainability. And, and in that realm, you know, I wanted to use as little heat as possible. And <clears throat> I didn't want to use any non-renewable resources. If I could help it, I wanted to use all renewable resources. And in this case, this is, I've got solar as my renewable resource and biomass or wood, my renewable resource. Ideally, um, since we have a heating dominant climate, we would put uh, the tank inside the building envelope so any heat loss is lost to the house and that's that much less heat I have to pay for. The space, of course, for a 2,000 gallon tank is somewhat sizable and uh, we didn't want to make the room for that in the house. So we thought the second best solution to that was to put it beneath the house and build the house on top. 
That way, if there's any, there's going to be some heat loss to the ground, but there will also be some to be no, below my house, into my house that way. The box itself is a, it's an eight by nine by 10 foot foam box made of pieces of four foot by eight foot by one foot thick sheets of foam. This, um, this EPS, ex expanded polystyrene. You can see the edge of it here where we cut in for this access hatch. This is, this is 12 inches deep. That's about 2,000 gallons of water that we'll put in this tank. You can see that the inside of the tank is this foam, is this EPS foam. And then on top of that foam is this liner. And this is, a, I believe it's a vinyl liner. It's about almost an eighth of an inch thick. And this liner, of course, is to keep the water away from the foam. And so this is essentially the liner is my tank. The foam is just the insulation. This pipe is the pipe that sucks the water from the tank. And uh, gets, the water goes up from here and it goes into the solar collection system, solar thermal system, it gets heated up and gets returned to the tank through this pipe into the solar stratifier, which I'll talk about in just a minute. I actually have another pipe right here. You can see my fingers on inside of this. And that pipe comes from here. It goes up to the coil that's in the firebox of the masonry heater. And it too comes back through this pipe into this stratifier. This is my domestic hot water heater. So of course this tank is going to be full of hot water and we're going to pump cold domestic hot water into this coil. And as it makes its way through the coil, it warms up. And by the time it leaves, it's going to be a temperature that, that I can use for taking a shower. Thermal stratification is the key to seasonal thermal storage in Alaska. The stratification is it's a thermodynamic process where fluids, when settled, can layer themselves into um, different layers of temperatures. So how do you get there? Well, the answer is this. It's a stratifier. Basically, the sock is always hanging like this, and the sun could be shining, and I could be getting 100 and 80 degree water coming off of the solar collectors. The water would come in to the bottom here at some at some speed and when it gets to the bottom here the the, the area opens up so it reduces the velocity of the water the speed of the water very quickly. What it's going to find is it's surrounded this nice hot water 180 degree water is surrounded by uh, less buoyant cold water say 80 degree water. So what does that mean? Well it means it's going to find its way up into the 100 degree water, into the 140 degree water where it's closer to its own buoyancy. Well, it can't get any higher than this, so it's gonna leave through the weave of this fabric of the stratifier. So the water is gonna come in and leave at the top. It won't leave at the bottom. Let's take a second situation. Hey, I'm pumping water from here and going to my floors, and it's gonna come back around, say, 75 degrees. Well, what happens then? I got 75 degree water coming in now, and it's going to come in here and it's going to say, oh, wait a second, this is close to my temperature. And it's going to leave, just due to buoyancy, it's going to leave the stratifier right around here. We don't have a, a lot of heat hitting our collectors in, say, December. So we have to count on some other heat source. Well, for me, it's that masonry heater. To not have the stratification at my fingertips and just rely on the average volume of the water being hot enough to something I can use, I would be having a fire in that thing 24-7. Um, perhaps maybe not quite that much, but I'd be burning a lot of wood to try to keep this whole tank at 120 degrees. This house shouldn't use more than three quarters of a quart of wood to supplement this heating all year. In fact, it should be less than that. I'm kind of being conservative. Um, so far as we've as we've used it this far, we're definitely on track for, for using less than that three quarters of a quart of wood. This system isn't just a, a heating system. It's a small component of a greater system, which is this house that has the R70 walls 
R115 in the in the ceiling or in the attic. Um, it's a component that's tied together with this nice, tight, warm building envelope that enables me to use very little heating throughout the year to use the equivalent of 280 gallons of fuel, you know, of, of heating energy.